good afternoon. Today we are in the systems engineering course 14th lecture and uh, we are going to discuss today about requirement analysis and much more details and what are the different aspects of it. Uh, so far we have been seeing systems engineering from the basic perspectives and today we will start looking into individual aspects of it. So, uh, today's presentation is requirement analysis as I said earlier and we will see what does this important step of systems engineering comprises of. So, to start with uh, the as we said SEP this stands for systems engineering process. So, requirement analysis is an very important step in the systems engineering process. Uh, it is a very important step that is what we need to do now or remember very important step and the first important step is also the first step and you start this you start from here. Uh, so, it is actually in a way that is why it is sometimes called as the SEP input the input to the systems engineering process. So, it is the first step in the systems engineering process and it is a very important step and it has two major inputs uh, or the it has two major parts. So, the inputs to the in a way to think about it is the inputs to the RA process to the requirement analysis process analysis process we call this as RA requirement analysis process that comprises of first one is customer requirements and project constraints. Uh, most of the time people call this as customer requirements the right usage of it is customers requirements, customers requirement or requirements. So, what is it? Customers requirements is these are basically uh, the requirements specified by the customer which is related directly this is related directly to what? To the performance characteristics, performance characteristics, characteristics whose performance characteristics of the system uh, of which system? System that is being designed. So, customer requirements are directly the related to the performance characteristics of the system that is being designed at this point. Okay. Uh, most of the time these are stated as stated as life cycle uh, needs and objectives. Uh, many a times uh, customer customers requirements or customers uh, needs are usually stated as life cycle needs and objectives. And uh, so, in a way in the simplest layman language the simplest way to think about it would be something like this. Uh, these requirements these means the requirements requirements they relate specifically relate on or relate to how well the system will work in its intended environment. Okay. So, the question here is that how these requirements they relate to how well the system will work in the intended environment of the system where it is intended to operate or intended to function. So, that is the first part the customers requirements. Second part is the project constraints and this is also important because project constraints they are existing conditions what are they? They are existing conditions existing conditions conditions what do they do which impose uh, limitations. or restrictions 
restrictions uh, due to various considerations various considerations and so there are many considerations this is considerations can be environmental they can be technological they can be a support it can be organizational and so on organizational and so on so there these are the conditions that impose limitations or restrictions due to various other various considerations that are outside the ambit of the system that is being designed usually they are outside the ambit of the system being designed so what do they do what is the, what is the importance of this the most important reason is the they they means the project constraints they limit they limit what they limit the development teams design opportunities so the design opportunities the teams capability to design a system that is being restricted or uh, a limitation is being put on to it or a constraint is put on being put on it so one aspect is the customer requirement customer would need or customers needs will be quite significant quite good well thought through and all those kind of things but there are also constraints within which that needs has to be fulfilled so these two the customers requirements or the customers needs and the project constraints are the two aspects that that together comprises the input to the uh, requirement analysis ra process so we also need to un understand that the requirements this statement requirements translate to performance characteristics of the system so the performance characteristics of a system is derived or obtained from the requirements whose requirements customers requirements so let's see how that can be talked about see the so primarily systems engineer focuses on requirements usually people say a systems engineer focus primarily on requirements why do the systems engineer focus on the requirements because system sep systems engineering sep's main purpose main purpose is to translate is to translate what translate the requirements into design of the system this can be translate or it could you can also use the word transform you're transforming the main purpose of systems engineering is to translate or transform the requirements into the system design so that is one of the reasons why systems engineer primarily focuses on the requirements uh, so one of the reason is uh, of the reason why we focus also another aspect is the designs remember we start we already said that instead of one design there are usually multiple designs or what we can call it as the alternatives the designs they are always the designs are always developed within it's always contained is limited within the constraints so within the constraints you develop the system the designs to satisfy the requirements all right good so as we said earlier constraints are limitations imposed due to other aspects or which bound the design opportunities so the thing is that the constraints plus what we call as the requirements together they are necessary for 
validating the design, validating the system design. So, the question here is you designed some system. So, some system has been designed, has been designed, this is accomplished. How do you check that this meets the customer requirements? How do you check that this fulfills the constraints? So, this process, the validation process is also an aspect of the uh, systems engineering process. So, that is why both the requirements and constraints are important and that is one of the reasons why requirement analysis is also one of the primary most important step of systems engineering. Okay. So, we now look into what are called as the type of requirements. Um, so, one of the first and foremost thing is there are many types of requirements. Remember especially, uh, especially software engineering or IT that up growth in IT systems have really created um, a complicated scenario and because of that there are a lot of requirements that have been specified. People say these are the type of requirements, some people call it as customer requirement, functional requirement, performance requirements, design requirements, synthesis requirements, derived requirements, so many of them. But what we are going to talk here about is we only focus on product based system or what we call as tangible products. And hence, uh, the subset that is relevant or is relevant to us are as follows. So, we talk about the, the first and foremost requirement that is uh, important to us is the customer requirement. We talk about this first one, customer requirement. So, what is a customer requirement or what are customer requirement or what are customers requirement apostrophe yes customers requirement. These are in a simplest way these are statements of facts, statements of facts and assumptions. That, so what does these statements of fact and assumptions do? These statements of facts and assumptions they define the expectations, the customers expectations from the system. So, in a way we are defining these facts and assumptions they define the customer expectation, what does the customer expects from the system that is being part of the customer requirement system. And how are these things stated? They are usually stated in terms of, in terms of or with respect to mission objectives, mission objectives, the operating environment, then we also have constraints and then effectiveness etcetera. So, the customer will state facts and assumptions based on uh, what he or she is expecting from the system and these statements could be in the term of mission objectives like as we said in the UAV example that the UAV should be able to carry out surveillance and reconnaissance missions, it should have an endurance of 6 hours or more or something like that, we discussed those kind of things. So, it might be expressed in terms of objectives of the mission. It could also be expressed in terms of it should be operating in all weather, so like an operating environment, it should take off from a simple uh, you know hard surface whether paved or unpaved, there should not be no, there should not be any need for a proper runway. So, that is another operating environment requirements, uh, you can say it should be silent and the propulsion should be based on uh, easily available type of fuels and those kind of stuff. So, those are constraints and it should be effective to be operated within for low intensity conflicts. 
So, that becomes the effectiveness of the system etc. So, there are many ways that the customer will state the requirements. So, obviously the question fundamental question here is who is the customer. So, let us ask this question who is the customer. Can we define that person? Can we pinpoint who the customer is? The answer to this problem is anyone who perform any or all of the eight uh, primary functions, primary you can call it as life cycle functions of systems engineering. That person is called as a customer, anyone who performs any a single or a subset or a whole of the eight primary life cycle functions. We already discussed what are these eight primary life cycle functions, but if you do not remember, let us discuss them once again. What are those eight primary life cycle functions? Uh, one will be the manufacturing or we can talk about it as the production or the construction. This will all be one life cycle function. The other will be deployment. third one will be development. I am not writing this in any particular order, but development, then there is a support, then there is a verification, then there is training, disposal and obviously, yes operation. I write operation as the last one, because this is also the most key this is the key or most important. So, in a way this is the key customer the operation the guy who operates the system is the key customer, but the person who is involved in manufacturing production and construction of the system or the deployment of the system or the development of the system or the support of the system or verification verifying that the system has been developed in fact is what it is meets the customer requirements and the constraints. The persons or the, the organizations that are involved in training, involved in disposal, they are all customers, they are all are part of the customers. Obviously, yes, obvi the importance is always given to the guy or the customer who is operating the system because that is the key customer, but other customers are also important. So, requirements specified by all of them becomes part of the customer requirements. So, that I hope that makes it the customer requirements aspect clear. So, then the second aspect that we need to talk about is the functional requirements. So, the functional requirements what are they? If you want to talk about it or if you want to make clarity on this or if you want to define this, how do you do that? So, loosely stated it can be stated as the necessary what are functional requirements? The necessary tasks or activities that the system must accomplish. So, the necessary task or activities that should be accomplished, who should accomplish? The system should accomplish. So, like for example, when we talk about the UAV, what are the some of the functional requirements? The functional requirements would be uh, it should fly obviously, it should carry a surveillance or a reconnaissance payload. Uh, it should be able to stay for a long time in this in the uh, air, it should be autonomous, it should decide when to fly, where to fly, what direction to take, when to turn, how much to turn, all those kind of things it should be able to do. So, those are the aspects, it should be able to perform all those necessary tasks or activities to fulfill the surveillance or recognizance requirements of the system. So, adding to this, okay, so the main question here main question that need to be answered here is what is it to be done? This is the question that need to be answered what is it to be done here and also the identified functional requirements. are usually used as 
the top level functions in the functional analysis. Uh, this is another aspect of systems engineering functional analysis. We will get to this little later down the uh, course as we progress. But when you identify the functional requirements initially, we are not talking about the detail, we are talking about functional requirements identification during requirement analysis. When you identify these functional requirements, then they typically form the top level functions for the functional analysis. Remember we talked about this as an iterative and recursive process. So, the top level from where you start before you drill it down, those aspects, those function basic statements, the top level functions are derived out of the functional requirements out of here. Okay. Then comes we talk about the third aspect which is the performance requirements. So, the fundamental question here, in the, here it is easy to start with the question. The question is how far the mission or the function should be realized or executed. The question fundamentally here is how far the mission or the function should be executed very or should be or realized or executed or putting it in a much simpler form you can ask this question in a different way how well does it, does it means does the system, it is the system, okay. uh, how well does it have to do what it is supposed to do. So, if somebody says do in the UAV um, do surveillance, to what level? Obviously, yes, if you want to identify the surveillance as okay, there is an automobile, a car is going on or an SUV is going on, a sports utility vehicle is going on or a truck is going on or a bus is going on. Is that identification sufficient enough or do you really want to identify the number plate of the car or the make and model of the car or do you want to identify how many people are sitting, traveling in that vehicle. So, if you just want to see okay, there is a vehicle that is traveling then that is one type of a requirement, that is one way of, one level of how well you are doing the surveillance. If you say I can see the color, I can also see the number plate of the car or the license plate of the car, then that is a different level of functional requirements or performance requirements. If you can identify, I can also see the, the license plate and as well as identify how many people who are traveling in that car, then that is a different set of functional or a sorry not functional performance requirement. So, that is where how well does it the system how to do what it is supposed to do. This is a quantification, a qualification how well it has to be done. It to, to further elaborate on this, it is, it is usually expressed in terms of quantity, quality, coverage. Uh, timeliness, readiness, etc. So, uh, performance requirements again as I said these are from the customer side we are talking about the input to the systems engineering process. So, there are multiple ways this gets stated and the performance requirements many a time stated in the terms of quantity, quality, coverage, timeliness, readiness, etc. These kind of stuff. So, and an example of this would be the UAV should be ready to be launched, assembled and ready to be launched in 20 minutes. That is a readiness requirement, it is a performance requirement. That means all the joints, connections, all those things, interconnection cables, everything should be done, the system should be ready, ground checked, ready to take off in 20 minutes means the designer now how to design systems which will actually meet this 20 minutes requirement, the performance requirement for assembly and take off readiness uh, by provided by the customer. We will discuss a much in much detail the UAV as a specific case immediately after this uh, completion of this lecture, uh, so that we can actually see how we run through the development of that system. Um, but anyway, uh, elaborating on this, <coughs> also the performance requirements 
I am call it as PR, the performance requirements are then applied across all identified functions. So, once you identify a performance requirement and you establish a performance requirement, it is then applied across all identified functions. So, if you say that okay, the endurance of the aircraft is, uh, it is supposed to stay in the air for 8 hours. So, then that requirement gets translated to different aspects of the, the function that are supposed, the functions that are identified, you know, what it is to be done. Is that 8 hours going to hamper the surveillance requirement? If the camera that is, that is put on the system is not capable of doing a recording for 8 hours, then yes, that, that will actually hamper the functional requirement of the system. So, it, that is one of the reasons why all the performance requirements gets, so this is actually a cross check or initial validation that happens here. So, we seen three type of requirements, customer requirements, functional requirements and performance requirements. So, now we will see other three types also, which we continued, which is called as the design requirements, derived requirements and allocated requirements. As I said earlier, there are many more, but these are the most important things that are applicable to our work. So, let us talk, talk about the design requirements first. The, so, what is the requirement, design requirement? The primary goal or primary question is how to execute. Or in a, the, this is where the person who is building the system asking the question how to build or how to execute or how to develop the system. So, this some people will also call it as how to develop. Some people call it as how to realize, how to design. All these questions are different manifestations of the design requirements of related to the requirements analysis. So, this also includes, includes the build to or code to and by two. Okay. So, in a way these are the adherences or requirements of products. So, you can say this product is built to a specific standard, design standard. You followed all the connection, interconnecting cables are using some one particular type of IEEE, some connectors or something is being used, which is where we are saying you are adhering to a standard, you are basically doing do according to a standard. Uh, and this is where you are imposing a design standard for realizing some specific aspect, because the reason of using this connector is it will reduce the assembly time, something like that. So, in a way the outputs like technical manuals, and technical data packages are derived out of these requirements. So, when we say that we are working on the design requirements, the output out of that to a large extent translates to the technical manuals and as well as the technical data packages of the system. So, design requirements is another aspect of the requirement analysis. Then comes is the derived requirements. These are as the name says, these are quite easy to understand. These are implied or transformed requirements. Uh, where are they informed or transformed? They are from a high level requirement of whom of the customer. So, the customer might have specified a high level requirement and from there it is something has been implied or transformed 
to realize that customer requirement. So, what are the stuff that is implied or transformed? So, let us take an example. We discussed the case of Dreamliner, Boeing 787. So, if you think about the Dreamliner, one of the things that we stated was that the requirements stated by the customer, requirements were long range operations, long range operations and shorter uh, travel time. So, the Dreamliner or the Boeing ended up creating the requirements as long range operations and shorter travel time. So, this is a high level requirement. Derivation out of that could be translated to something like low weight and high speed. This could be further broken down low weight could be talked about using of usage of composites and other things, but that is not part of this at this point. This is about the how, okay. how do we accomplish this that is not part of the uh, requirement analysis at this point. It will become a part much later down the road. We are talking about the initial stages. Initially you are when we are talking about a derived requirements you are translating a high level customer requirement into a uh, implied or a transformed requirement which is of uh, which can be further translated into something that is a, a quickly a technological achievement or some a specific uh, specification of a subsystem that would actually help you to realize that uh, transformed or, or derived requirement. Then is the last one which is called as the allocated requirements. So, here it is this is a little bit tricky one, but let us see how does this works about. So, by definition this is actually a it is a newly established requirement uh, that is obtained by how is it obtained that is obtained by dividing or partitioning partitioning the high level requirements requirements into multiple low level requirements. These are di different from the derived requirement because you are kind of not translating or transforming it into something else. When somebody says long range operations, it does not get transformed into as low weight. Here like for example, is let us say if you say the total maximum take off weight which is usually called as MTOW of the UAV, let us say we call that as 20 kgs. Then this 20 kg can be divided into airframe structure let us say 10 kg, talk about it as propulsion let us say 1.5 kg. Then we can talk about it as communication 0.5 kg, control systems let us talk about it as a 1 kg. So, we have 10, 11, 12, 12 and a half about 13 kgs of this and then we talk about as payload equal to 7 kg fulfilling the 20 kg. Uh, total requirement. So, the 20 kg gets subdivided into different components of the UAV and then you can further talk about the payload being further divided into fuel let us say 5 kg and camera equals 2 kg I am just using numbers. So, here the same attribute a high level requirement is being subdivided into its component requirements is allocated about different aspects of the system. Where, so, this is the difference between allocated requirements and derived requirements because derived requirement where talk about long range operations. So, let us say Boeing said 8000 miles non-stop flying range might have translated to a weight of something called as like some x tons or something like this. 
so that they can actually realize this much of a range. So, here it is translated or transformed into something else, here it is actually subdivided into the same aspect. So, that is what an allocated requirement is all about. Well, continuing on this, uh, when you do the basic operational requirements or when you do the operational requirement analysis, you end up asking a lot of questions, a ton of questions. So, the first question that we need to ask is where will the system be used or this is the usage question or which will give the environment or the operational environment aspects of the system. So, if we can properly ask answer this question where will the system be used, it will actually give you the operational environment. Once you answer this properly, you can you will be able to define where all will be the system be used in, in its operational capabilities. How will the system accomplish its objective which is the second question. So, this is the what you call as it is a uh, how the functions will be fulfilled or in a way how will the system operate that is the question that you are actually underlying question behind this, uh, this aspect. So, once you answer this question properly you will be able to identify how the system will be able to how the system will be operating to achieve its objectives. Uh, then we talk about what are the critical system parameters. So, if you have to focus on something or focus on specifics, what are the things that you need to focus on? What are the critical things that need to be uh, there to ensure that the system, uh, system works properly? Like for example, one of the critical parameters for a UAV will be what is the stall speed So, and what should be the altitude. So, the system will always check for whether the current in air speed of the system is more than the stall speed so that the UAV is flying because if it is less than the stall speed then the UAV is not flying it is falling down. Similarly, it is also be talking about at what altitude it is flying because as you go on higher what happens is the air becomes thinner and the air becomes thinner it reduces the lift. When it reduces the lift then you require to need to fly faster to derive that same amount of lift. So, it might be outside the performance realm of the engine. So, you might not you might not want to fly above a certain altitude which will be the operational ceiling of ceiling capability of the engine. So, these are the critical uh, system parameters that one need to identify and understand when you are designing the system. And then the next question will be how will how will various system components be used. So, in the case of a UAV we will be talk about how will the gimbal be used to control or guide the camera, how will the, uh, the battery changing mechanism will be used, how will the communication system be used, uh, where will you have the redundancy in communication, how, whether the payload and the telemetry will be on two channels or one channel or they will be merged, separated, splitted, encoded all these aspects. Uh, how will the various components of the system will be used in functioning that aspect comes out of this particular question and how effective the system will be in performing the mission. So, uh, like uh, for example, you can say that uh, uh, everybody wants the system to do everything in the world under the sun, but not possible. So, in the case of UAV one question that you can ask is uh, can it do day and night operations, can it fly in the day and fly, in, fly in, can it fly in the night day you might require just a normal camera uh, which because you have sunlight to see the things and you can take the video or picture of it. But in the night it might not be the same you might require an another thermal imaging camera to see images uh, in the night to differentiate temperature and aspect. So, it might not be possible to carry both of the payload at the same time. So, then if the time changes from day to night if you are only carrying one payload then you have to land the UAV change the payload and then take off again. But if both the cameras are mounted at the same time, then whether the time changes from day to night, it does not matter, the system can actually continue to fly. So, that is also another aspect, how effective the system will be in performing the, performing the mission. Then the question will be how efficient the system will be in performing the mission. So, let us say if you say that we put 3 kg or not kg sorry, 3 liters of fuel in the UAV, how can it fly for 8 hours? So, then you can say 
based on the input versus output, uh, you can find that okay, this UAV is operating at X percent efficiency. How efficiently it can actually utilize the fuel. The fuel efficiency is one aspect. You can also talk about you know how much of in time the how much of uh, in fatigue is developed by the uh, pilot while operating the UAV. That is so if the UAV does not create pilot fatigue, then it's efficient in managing pilot fatigueness. So the effectiveness is about the uh, how well it can do uh, things, whereas the efficiency is about how how it, the system can perform or derive, deliver better output or more output for the same level of input. Then next question is how long the system will be in use or the longevity or what we call as the life duration. Then how do, uh, at what, what phase we will be uh, using, how long we will be using and how, uh, when will, when you will be talking about disposing the system, that aspects. Then third, last question, one other thing also, what are the operating environment, environments where effective operation is expected? So, if we talk about UAV, can it fly in rain? Uh, can it fly in below zero temp? Can it fly or take off from Mount Everest? So, these kind of questions. So, like what are the operating environments? You are defining where the system is expected to be put into use. And that is important, it is very important for any person who is designing because this is a part of the requirements and it is also a part of the constraints as we talked earlier. So, these kind of basic questions that we talked about help you to realize what are the basic operational requirements of the system. Because once you understand the operational requirements, then you can translate those things into performance requirements. Remember, per operation requirements are different from the performance requirements. So, now we talk about the aspects of good requirements. Uh, what are the important aspects? When do we call as a So, anybody can make a requirement as uh, this is a specific requirement. But when do you make that call that requirement, okay, this requirement specification is actually good, this is bad, this is not up to the mark, it need to be revised. So, what are some of the characteristics by which we can classify the uh, capability or the, uh, the goodness of uh, requirements. So, the first one is what we call as achievability. This means a good, any requirement, a good requirement must be achievable. Achievable which means a solution is technically feasible, technically feasible within the considered cost. Within the cost that is considered, within the affordability, this cost is equivalent to the affordability. Within the affordability of the system that is being already talked about or discussed with, there is a technically feasible solution available or in a way, if that is there, then that requirement is achievable, a specific requirement is achievable. So, if the, uh, if somebody comes and says the UAV should take off uh, with a speed much more faster than a uh, rocket that is going to the moon, uh, it might not be something that is technically feasible. Uh, so, then that will not be a good requirement. Uh, so, somebody would say it should be able to climb 100 feet in like 1 minute, achievable. So, these kind of, so a requirement which is, uh, which will allow the customer to fulfill what he or she is looking for and is technically feasible within the appropriate, appropriateness of the cost is what we call as an achievable requirement. So, achievability is one of the prime importance of what, of a good requirement. The second aspect is what we call as a verifiability. So, it must be verifiable where, so what is verifiable, where it allows for objective, objective and quantitative 
And this quantitativeness you can think about as preference, preferably quantitative verification. So, if you say that uh, if you talk about a requirement, it should be objective, you should be able to objectively and quantitatively. So, it is an objectively is the right word, objectively and quantitatively. You should be able to objectively and quantitatively verify this. Well, obviously, you will ask the question, can it be qualitatively verified? Yes, you can, but the things like if you talk about the qualitative stuff like uh, it should be efficient, sufficient, it should be resistant, it should be excessive, these kind of words does not allow for a verifiable stuff. If I say that the water should be watch, the watch should be water resistant, sorry. So, if I buy a watch and says it should be water resistant, what does it mean? I mean, it should be water resistant just uh, for like you just put it in a bucket of water and should be resisting or you take the watch to 40 feet below the sea and it should still be, the water should not enter the system. So, many a times people will specify the water resistance as a depth specific. So, take a watch and look at the bottom of it, it actually specifies how much is the water resistance. So, that is what the verifiability of it is. So, the way to verify that it is take the watch, take it to a, that particular level of uh, depth in a water body and see whether the water is entering the system or not. So, that is a verifiable requirement, not just saying that it should be water resistant. That is not a verifiable requirement because water resistant can be a whole spectrum of things. So, that is the verifiability aspect of a requirement. Then the third one we talk about is unambiguity. Unambiguity means it should be unambiguous or have only one possible meaning. So, it should be unambiguous. So, the person if you look at the requirement and get two or three different interpretations of the requirement then that is ambiguous. So, it should be unambiguous, there should be no ambiguity or there should be only one possible interpretation or one possible meaning to the requirement. If that is the case, then that requirement is considered as a good requirement. Then the next one we talk about here is the completeness of the requirement. So, it must be complete. So, obviously, you can say it must be complete, but what does this complete means? Complete and complete where it should comprise of, of all information necessary, all information necessary to understand the customer's need. So, it should be complete, all aspects of the customer's need should be covered in the requirement, that is when it makes a good requirement. So, what are the some of the customer requirements? Those will be like mission profiles, operations, ops and maintenance needs, needs, and we talk about the constraints, etcetera. So, the customer might have many needs, customer needs might be quite a lot, but the when a need it becomes a or the requirement becomes a good requirement when it is complete, when it is comprised of all information necessary to understand the customer need, that is when you call it as a complete requirement. Then comes the next part which is called as why and what not how. So, what we talk about it is here the requirement should be expressed in terms of need, of need, not in terms of solution. So, it is like somebody making a statement that, okay, I am thirsty, I need water or I need to, I am thirsty. So, the person can provide you water or tea or juice, something like that. So, if I make the statement saying that, uh, I am thirsty, so please take a glass of water, wash it in cold warm water, then fill it with a water, fill it with a wa uh, water that is at a temperature of 40 degrees Celsius, 
and uh, put a vitamin tablet into that or something like that. So, I am just giving a really ridiculous example to say what not to do. So, the how is not the important part. The customer should not specify the how, customer should only specify why and what. Okay. So, in a way we are talking about why and what of the need. So, who gets to do the how? The designer. How is the need going to be fulfilled? That, that is as part of this design of the system. So, let that be not part of the requirement. It is usually sometimes people try to get into the how, the customer tries to get into the how which usually puts a much larger constraint. So, the how usually, how at this juncture or at this time of the system development usually puts a tighter constraints. So, the designer might not get that much of freedom to really realize the system. Uh, to the fullest potential. So, this is also an important aspect of the system uh, or good requirement. Then we talk about is the consistency. Well, this is a very uh, common, uh, very obvious one, but the important aspect distinction here is it must be consistent, consistent with what? With other requirements. So, if somebody says I want an aircraft which is lightweight and say please build it with stone, then obviously it might not be possible. So, the consistency or, or what you call as the user should know where it becomes, where, it, where the requirements are consistent and where the requirements are not consistent. Uh, so, like for example, if you find if any inconsistency noted it should be resolved upfront. So, many a times this is one aspect where the user needs gets confusing cons and consistency aspect and quite a lot of the user requirements are, can be inconsistent. If so, then they need to be resolved at that point and then the user need to or the customer need to decide which one or which way the inconsistency will be resolved is it in favor because you will have to pick and choose or favor of some certain performance characteristics or requirement. So, that discussion usually happens with the customer or the user and once that it is done then the uh, consistent the inconsistencies are removed and then the need becomes a consistent. So, if the requirement is an achievable requirement a verifiable requirement unambiguous requirement it is complete in itself and it is focusing on why and what and not on the how and consistent with other things, then we call that as a good requirement at this uh, good requirement at this juncture. Thank you.